My good morning, everyone. Welcome back to my channel. We're going to talk about Vana today, and we are in the gardens of Vana, if you cannot tell. So to speak about Vana, we need to talk about Orme, who is her husband. And this is coming from the Silmarillion and the Valaquenta. So the very first part here, after we have the Aino Lindale, it says that Right here, the spouse of Orme is Vana, the ever young. She is the younger sister of Yavana. All flowers spring as she passes and open if she glances upon them and all birds sing at her coming. Now it goes a little bit more into detail with that in terms of more about what Vana um, was described as and also her part in the wedding of Tulkis and Nessa. So here it says, after the wedding, then Tulkis slept, being wary and content. But before that, it says here that, now therefore the Valar were gathered upon Almarin and feasted and made merry, fearing no evil and because of the light of Aluin, they did not perceive the shadow in the north that was cast far from afar by Melkor, for he was grown dark as the night of the void. And it is sung that in that feast of the spring of Arda, Tulkis espoused Nessa, the sister of Orme, and Vana robed her in her flowers, and she danced before the Valar upon the green grass of Almarin. Then Tulkis slept, being weary and content. So you see how Vana is described as the queen of flowers and she was robed herself in flowers and she also dressed Nessa in flowers when she got married to Tolkis. So Vana has basically the powers of, of beauty and being youthful. And she was the second youngest. She was actually the sister of Yavana and she was a little bit older than Nessa, but she, was very much akin to Yavana because Yavana was the kind of the, the mother nature Valar of the trees and all of nature. And Vana was her younger sister that was in charge of all the flowers and the beauty of the um, small little creatures. So she also was um, in domain with the flora and the fauna of Arda but she took care more of the flowers. And so she was called the queen of the flowers. And there's more of a description here that Melian was the name of Amaya, Amaya who served both Vana and Este. And she dwelt long in Lorien, tending the trees that flower in the gardens of Ermo, ere she came to Middle Earth. Nightingales sang about her whenever she went. So Melian was also one of the attendants of Vana and Este. So the gardens, once again, of Este and of Vana are very beautiful, filled of wonderful flowers, and especially yellow star-shaped flowers, which we will talk a little bit about in a bit here. The next place where she appears is this important part here. She is associated with the sun. And here it says, the maiden whom the Valar chose from among the Maiar to guide the vessel of the sun was named Arian. And he that steered the island of the moon was Tilion. In the days of the trees, Arian had tended the golden flowers in the gardens of Vana and watered them with the bright dews of Laureline. But Tilion was a hunter of the company of Orme, and he had a silver bow. He was a lover of silver, and when he would rest, he forsook the woods of Orome and going into Lorien, he lay in dream by the pools of Este, in Talpirian's flickering beams, and he begged to be given the task of tending forever the last flower of silver. Arian, the maiden, was mightier than he, and she was chosen because she had not feared the heats of Laureline and was unhurt by them being from the beginning a spirit of fire, whom Melkor had not deceived nor drawn to his service, 
Too bright were the eyes of Arian for even the Eldar to look on, and leaving Valinor, she forsook the form and raiment, which like the Valar she had worn there, and she was as na a naked flame, terrible in the fullness of her splendor. So she was actually one of the Maiar that actually also too worked with Vana. And so Vana is associated with gold and the color of yellow and associated with the energy of the sun. And you get a little bit more detail within the Book of Lost Tales. And here is one right here. This is a good part that... Below the other was the spouse of Ordermay, the hunter who is named Alderon, king of forests, who shouts for joy upon mountaintops and is nigh as lusty as that perpetual youth Tolkis. Ordermay, Ordermay is the son of Aule and Palorin, and that Tari, who is his wife, is known to all as Vana, the fair and loveliest mirth and youth and beauty, and is happiest of all beings, for she is Tulure, or as the Valar said, Vana. To Ivana, who bringeth spring, and all sing her praises as Tari Lassi, mistress of life. So she was actually associated with spring. And so on May 21st or the 22nd, depending where you are, there is a certain type of festival that is associated with her called the Birth of Flowers. It is Nost na Lothion. And this is where it speaks about this particular festival that we will be celebrating together uh, tomorrow, if you can come to the private video that will be our ritual. In these ways that bitter winter passed and the snows lay deeper than ever before on the encircling hills, yet in its time a spring of wondrous glory melted the skirts of those white mantles and the valley drank the waters and burst into flowers. So came and passed with rivalry of children the festival of Nost, Lo, Nost Na Lothion or the birth of flowers and the hearts of the gondolim were uplifted for the good promise of the year, and now at length is that great feast, Taran Asta, or the gates of summer, near at hand. So right before Taran Asta, the, the festival of summer, you have the birth of flowers. So it happens in May around this time, and this is a special celebration that is going to be uh, definitely associated with Vana because she was queen of the flowers herself. And we get more into some of her powers here. Her powers are explained here in the coming of the Valar in the Book of Lost Tales. Now in the Minmos Vale, they digged two great pits and those are leagues asunder yet nigh together beside the vastness of that plain. In the one did Ulmo set seven rocks of gold brought from the most silent deeps of the sea and a fragment was cast thereafter of the lamp that had burned a while upon Helkar in the south. Then was the pit covered with rich earths that Paloran devised, and Vana came who loveth life and sunlight, and at whose song the flowers arise and open, and the murmur of her maidens round her was like to the merry noise of folk that stir abroad for the first time on a bright morning. There sang she the song of spring upon the mound and danced upon it and watered it with great streams of that golden light that Ulmo had brought from the spilled lakes, yet was Kuluin almost overflowing at the end. So she, like Nessa, also danced. So she's associated with that type of energy of being youthful and dancing and especially singing. She has a power with her voice. Here you get more of her where Orme's domains is actually expressed. And then we see more what Vana is about. Now Orme had a vast domain and it was beloved by him and no less by Pelor and his mother. Yavana, that's her other name. Behold, the groves of trees they planted upon the plain of Valinor, and even upon the foothills of the mountains have no compare on earth. Beasts reveled there, deer among the trees, and herds of kine among its spaces, and wide grasslands, 
bison there were, and horses roaming unharnessed. But these strayed never into the gardens, yet were they in peace, and had no fear, for beasts of prey dwelt not among them, nor did Orme fare to hunting in Balinor, much indeed as he loves those realms, yet he is very often in the world without, more often even than Ose, and as often as Pelorian. And then does he become the greatest of all huntsmen. But in Valmar, his halls are wide and low, and skins and fells of great richness and price are strewn there. Without end upon the floor are hung upon the walls, and spears and bows and knives thereto. In the midst of each room and hall, a living tree grows and holds up the roof, and its boil is hung with trophies and with antlers. Here is all Orme's folk in green and brown, and there is a noise of boisterous mirth, and the Lord of Force makes lusty cheer. So he kind of represents the Mirkwood elves. But Vanna, his wife, so often as she may steals thence, far away from the echoing courts of that house, lie her gardens, fenced stoutly from the wilder lands, with white thorn of great size that blossoms like everlasting snow. Its innermost solitude is walled with roses, and this is the place best beloved of that fair lady of the spring. Admiss most of this place of odious air did Aule set long ago that cauldron, gold kaluin, filled ever with the radiance of Loreline, like shining water, and there of he contrived a fountain so that all the garden was full of the health and happiness of its pure light. Birds sang there all the year with the full throat of spring, and flowers grew in a riot of blossom and of glorious life. Yet was none ever that splendor spilled from the vat of gold, save when Vanna's maidens, led by Erwin, left that garden at the waxing of Silpayan to water the roots of the tree of flame. But by the fountain it was always light with the amber light of day, as bees made busy about the roses, and there trod Vanna, lissomely, while larks sang above her golden head. So now we start to get more of the description of Vanna in a way that we might not get it in the Silmarillion. So it is very helpful to look at the Lost Tales, and you really get a nice description and a clear image of the Valar themselves. And so this Valier, she is golden-haired, and she is described as one of the youngest with Nessa, uh, the second youngest, and she is um, always the one that can make the flowers bloom. You know, she represents beauty and she has the, the power of, of life, of sunlight. You know, just as flowers open up to the light of the sun, they open up to the light of her face. And that's how beautiful she is. She represents that sunlight. And I think that that is a nice uh, pairing with Orme, who also um, represents kind of a sun energy, but he has more of that hunter type of energy within him, very much like the Mirkwood elves in Middle Earth. So you can start to see the energy there. And the difference is that Vanna, although she enjoys her husband, Orme, and, and probably loves to live with him, she also likes to tend to her garden. And she goes for her own sense of peace and just to relax in her own special space. So if you put yourself into Vanna's garden and her frame of mind, it could be a very peaceful place like Este's gardens as well. And then this is when we start to get a little bit more of her personality and what she thinks about Melkor. <laughs> so this is when she, we have, we have the part when Melkor is making trouble for the Valar and Vanna definitely has some feelings about it. Tolkis actually drags Melkor to the feet of Manwe to be judged and to, um, to speak his, his case of why he's making so much trouble. And so this is what happens. Now is a court set upon the slopes of Taniquatil and Melko arranged before all the valley great and small, lying bound before the silver chair of Manwe, 
against him speaketh Ose and Orme and Ulmo in deep air, and Vana in ab abhorrence, proclaiming his deeds of cruelty and violence. Yet Makar still spoke for him, although not warmly, for said he. And then he talks, he's basically a voice for Melkor, saying that all this loveliness in, Val, in Valinor is not for me. And, you know, that's why he likes to cause discord. He likes to break that up a little bit, all that peacefulness. But you can see that Vana is one of the, the, the Valar that end up actually speaking about how, you know, she is the one that proclaims the deeds of cruelty and violence of Melkor, nobody else. So along with her being one that represents being ever young and beauty, she also has a fiery nature within her. And I like that Tolkien added that so that she's not just a silent, beautiful type of uh, figure, but she has her own thoughts. And so that assertiveness and her speaking her mind is a, a nice balance with her gentleness and her beauty that she represents as well. So I thought that that was a great part that she is the one who actually speaks up and says, you know, your cruelty and your violent acts, Melkor, you better watch it. So this part here is when we start to get more of Vana's powers. And this is the part where um, she's talking about the trees. So wherefore does Vana arise and seek Lor Lauren, um, Lorian, and with them go or Wendy and Silmo, and many of both Valley and the Elves, and they gather much light of gold and silver in great vessels and fare sadly to the ruined trees. This is the part when Melkor does actually ruin the two trees, the Telperion and Lorlin. There singeth Lorlin. Uh, most wistful songs of magic and enchantment about the stock of Silpion, and he bid water his roots with the radiance of Tilimpe, and this was lavishly done. I'll bet small store thereof remained now in the dwellings of the gods. In like manner doth Vana, and she sings old golden songs of the happier days, and bids her maidens dance their bright dances, even such as they were used to dance upon the sward of the rose gardens, nigh Kulinin. And as they danced, she flooded the roots of Lorlin with streams from out her golden jars. Yet all their singing and enchantment is of little worth, and though the roots of the trees seem to drink all that they may pour, Yet can they see no stir of life renewed, nor faintest gleam of light, nor withered leaf glows with sap, nor blossom lifts its drooping stem. Indeed, in the frenzy of their grief, they had poured out all the last remaining stores of brightness that the Valar re retained, had not of a fortune Manwe and Aule come upon them in that hour, being drawn thither by their singing in the gloom, and stayed them, saying, Lo, O Vanna, and thou, O Laureline, Laure, Laurian, what is this rashness? And wherefore do ye not first take counsel of ye brethren? For know ye not that which ye spill on thinking upon the earth is become more precious than all the things the world contains? And when it is gone, perchance not all the wisdom of the gods may get us more. Then Vana said, pardon, O Manwe Sulamo, and yet, and let my sorrow and my tears be my excuse. Yet aforetime did this drought fail never to refresh the heart of Laureline, and she bare ever in return a fruit of light more plentiful than we gave. And methought the gods sat darkly in their halls, and for the weight of their grief essayed no remedy of their ills. But behold, now have Laureline uh, and I put forth our spells, and naught may they avail, and Vana wept. Now was it the thought of many that those twain, Lord, 
Lorian and Vanna might not avail to heal the wounds of Laureleen and Silpion, in that no word of the Earth Lady, Mother of Magics, was mingled in their spells. Therefore, many said, let us seek Polarin, who is uh, Yavanna, for of her magic, maybe these trees shall again know some portion of their ancient glory. And then if light be renewed, Aule and his craftsmen may repair the hurts of our fair realm and happiness will be once more twixt. But of the darkness and ill days that had long been without the hills, few recked or thought. Now, therefore, they called for Yavanna and she came and asked them, what they would and hearing she wept and spoke before them saying know ye o valar and ye sons and daughters of the eldar children of aluvatar first offspring of the forest of the earth that never may these two trees bloom again and others like them may not be brought to life for many ages of the world but this is what vana says then said vana how then sayest thou, Aule, mighty contriver, who art called Itaka Marda, smith of the world, for the might of thy works? How are we to obtain light that is needful to our joy? For what is Valinor without light? Or what art thou, and thou loosest thy skill, as Mesum in this hour thy spouse has done? Nay, said Aule, Light may not be fashioned by smithcraft, O Vana, nor can any even of the gods devise it if the sap of the trees of wonder be dried forever. So this is when this is when uh, Vana is 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 basically getting the idea that um, the trees are pretty much ruined. But there is still some hope here. And we see this, that, uh, but Vana comprehended not Yavanna's mind, thinking only of her tree of gold, Laureline, and she abode ill content. But Manwe and Varda, and with them Aule and Yavanna, fared thence, and in secret conclave they took deep and searching counsel one of another, and at the last they bethought them of a ready of hope. Then did Manwe call together all the folk of Valinor once more, and that great throng was gathered even in Vanna's bower and missed her roses, where Kaluin's fountains were, for the plain without lay now all cold and dark. There came even the leaders of the elves and sat at the feet of the Valar, nor had that before been done. But when all were come together, Aule rose and said, Hearken ye all, a ready has Manwe Sulamo to declare, and the mind of the Earth Lady and of the Queen of the Stars is therein, not yet is my counsel absent. So now we have the council here, and here's where Vana comes in. So now we see Vana at length, therefore, did Manwe bid Yavana to put forth her power. And she was loath, but the clamor of the folk constrained her, and she begged for some of the radiance of white and gold. But of this would Manwe and Aule spare only two small vials, saying that if the draught of old had power to heal the trees, already had they been blooming, for Vanna and Lor Lorian had poured it unstintingly upon their roots, then sorrowfully. Yavanna stood upon the plain and had her form trembled and her face was very pale for the greatness of the effort that her being put forth, striving against faith. Midway she stood between the trees and utter silence fell. Then there was a great noise heard and none knew what passed, but Yavanna lay swooning on the earth. But many leapt beside her and raised her from the ground and she trembled and was afraid. Vain, O oh, children of the gods, she cried, is all my strength. Lo, at your desire, I have poured my power upon the earth like water, and like water the earth has sucked it from me. It is gone, and I can do no more. But nonetheless, folk left that place in sorrow, save Vanna only, and she clung to the bowl of Laureline and wept. 
Now was the time of faintest hope and darkness most profound fallen on Valinor that was ever yet, and still did Vanna weep, and she twined her golden hair about the bowl of Laureline, and her tears dropped softly at its roots. And even as the dew of her gentle love touched the tree, behold, a sudden pale gleam was born in those dark places. Then gazed Vanna in wonder, and even where her first tears fell, a shoot sprang from Laureline, and it budded. And the buds were all of gold, and there came light, therefrom like a ray of sunlight beneath a cloud. Then sped Vanna a little way out upon the plain, and she lifted up her sweet voice with all her power, and it came trembling faintly to the gates of Almar, and all the Valar heard. Then said Omar, "'Tis the voice of Vanna's lamentation." But Salmar said, "'Nay, listen more, for rather is there joy in that sound, and all that stood be hearkened, and the words they heard was, "'Light hath returned.'" So now we start to see that Vanna's tears and her love for her tree started to make something appear. And although it was a small budding at first, one flower there was, however, greater than the others, more shining and more richly golden. And it swayed to the winds, but fell not, and it grew. And as it grew of its own radiant warmth, it fruitified. Then all its petals flew, uh, fell, and were treasured. A fruit there was of great beauty hanging from the bough of Laureline. But the leaves of the bough grew, and they shriveled and shone no more. Even as they dropped to earth, the fruit waxed wonderfully, for all the sap and radiance of the dying tree were in it. And the juices of that fruit were like quivering flames of amber and of red, and its pips like shining gold, but its rind was of a perfect lucency, smooth as a glass whose nature is transfused with gold, and there through the moving of its juices could be seen within like throbbing furnace fires. So great became the light and richness of that growth, and the weight of its fruitfulness, and that bough bent thereunder, and it hung as a globe of fire before their eyes. So this is when fruit started to appear as kind of the last ray of hope for Laureline. And Vana becomes a very important part in creating actually the uh, the new lamps, which would be the sun and the moon, and the sun is here. So now we have, now the most ardent radiance poured therein, neither spilled nor dimmed, nor did that vessel receive any injury therefrom. Yet would it swim the airs more lightly than a bird, and Aule was overjoyed, and he fashioned that vessel like a great ship, broad, broad of beam, lying one half of the rind within the other so that its strength might not be broken. There follows an account of how Vanna, repenting of her past murmurings, cut short her golden hair and gave it to the Valar, and from her hair they wove sails and ropes more strong than any Marinar hath seen, yet of the slenderness of Gossamer. The mats and sp spars of the ship were all of gold." Then that the ship of the heavens might be made ready unto the last, the unfading petals of the latest flower of Laureline were gathered like a star at her prow, and tassels and streamers of glancing light were hung about her bulwarks, and a flash of lightning was caught in her mast to be a pennant. But all that vessel was filled to the brim with the blazing radiance of gold kaluin, and mingled therein drops of the juices of the fruit, of noon, and these were very hot, and thereafter scarcely might the bosom of the earth withhold her, and she leapt at her cords like a captive bird that listeth for the airs. So now we have the sunship that would be pulled by Arian, the mire of the fire, and so now this is where the sun comes, and it, and it could only be really brought together with Vanna's hair, 
of gold. So she is definitely associated with the sun. There is a strong connection there. And there's a note by Christopher Tolkien where he says that the sunlight, uh, the Valar indeed play different roles throughout. And here far greater importance attaches to the acts of Vanna and Lor uh, Lorien whose relations with the sun and moon are at once deeper and more explicit than they, than they afterwards became as they had been with the trees in the Silmarillion. It was Nienna who watered the trees with her tears. And in the Silmarillion, the sun and moon move nearer to Arda than the ancient stars. But here they move at quite different levels in the firmament. And so in this lost tale, this is the tale of Vana's connection with the sun and Lorian's connection with the moon. So you start to see this sun power that Vana represents. And I will read the part here. I think I did already, didn't I, about the birth of the flowers? Yes, I did. So I will go right to talking about the powers now because we can look at Vana and we can appreciate her for her her beauty and what she represents within the Silmarillion and the way that Tolkien writes about her with so much care and so much description and, and poetic um, imagery is just really beautiful but what does that mean you know what's the deeper meaning behind it and how can we use the images that Tolkien gives us to help our lives and, and increase our own happiness, which is what the Tia Elda Lieva, the Elven Spiritual Path is all about. It is all about harnessing the powers of the Valar and turning them around and representing them on earth here so that we can actually bring forward this beauty of Arda that is expressed but it is earth because that's how tolkien originally intended arda to be was actually earth and so vana's powers is ever young youthfulness and although we will age we can always carry a spirit of youthfulness of forever young and i have a video on the fountain of youth which talks about what the fountain of youth truly is when people have been looking for immortality in a bottle or in a fountain and they would dip a vial in and they were hoping that they would receive this special gift of immortality and forever youthfulness. What does that really mean? I have met people that are much older and they are in you know, their 70s or even their 80s, but yet they carry the spirit of youthfulness that is beautiful to see. And so Vana represents youthfulness at any age and forever young. And we can talk about that because it's a time to rejoice and carry the energy of Nessa with her youthfulness into more of a spirit of innocence and purity that Vana represents. And that's why she was able to bring back a little bit of the fruit, a little bit of the flowers and the, the, of the, the golden light of Laureleen. She had that purity, that love. And so she represents that life force. And when you have that spirit of youthfulness within you at any age, it can keep you going in life because it's energy. It is like the sunlight. As all things need sunlight to live, energy within yourself, it is like the sun of your soul and it keeps you going. And so this is where you can start to maintain the belief and the hope and the curiosity to remain forever young in spirit. You know, you just have to have the spirit of a child within any age is a spirit to be playful, to be curious, to dare to dream and believe, believe in things that maybe adults might not believe because they might need more concrete evidence that it exists. 
But Vana was the only one that remained. Even Yavana, her older sister, said, nope, the trees are gone. They're gone. But Vana stayed. She stayed with Laureline one last time. She represents that. I think Tolkien did that on purpose to show that children often have that spirit of belief and it is a power because when you believe in things that cannot be seen, you are getting to the true reality of energy and spirit. And so a lot of times children represent being able to enjoy and appreciate the magic of life. And so she had that hope that Yavana, her older sister, did not have, and yet she was able to bring back that fruit to Laureline with that hope. So it is like finding the fountain of youth for ourselves, carrying the essence of, of being childlike and innocent, but within every age. And there's certain things that you can do, but it's more about being aware of who you are in a childlike way and appreciating that about yourself. If you have some childlike tendencies still at any age, appreciate it. This is a time to celebrate that within yourself, to look at yourself and say, oh, I like to play this, or I still like to do this, or I still, maybe I like to collect dolls or stuffed animals. These are things that keep you with a sense of youthfulness. It's something to hold on to, not so much um, to put you back into your past or you're afraid to let go, but it's more about honoring that piece of you, that you were a child, that all of us started out as little babies. And so there's a part of keeping that childlike spirit inside of us that will keep you forever young at any age. So Vana represents that, that belief, that hope that she keeps, and it actually brings Laureline back to life. She also represents beauty. Beauty, as it says, that all flowers spring as she passes and open if, if she glances upon them all and all birds sing at her coming and she robed herself in flowers and had golden hair as she represented the sun energy. So the flowers and the fauna and the beauty. And I want to talk about beauty because beauty, I think, is truly subjective and all of us find different things beautiful. And I think that is the most beautiful thing about beauty in the universe is that there's not one particular type of beauty and that the idea of a universal beauty can sometimes be misleading because one person may not see something as another person does being beautiful. But this is a time to celebrate the beauty around you in your environment so you can go outside and you can enjoy the beauty of nature around you you can enjoy the beauty of your home and your environment that you have created you can enjoy the beauty of those around you and you can certainly try to celebrate the beauty of yourself in fact i highly recommend it use that power of vana to increase a, an awareness and a knowledge about yourself being beautiful as well, because each of us have a certain type of beauty. And this is a time maybe that you can explore new looks for yourself. It's a time to um, appreciate the beauty that you have. You could do a mirror exercise, which it really helps when you can look at yourself in a mirror from maybe 30 seconds to a minute, maybe longer if you need and smile at yourself in the mirror. And I know it might sound strange, but just smile at your reflection. And then what I want you to do is I want you to pick out a couple features or at least one if you have a hard time with this. And I want you to compliment yourself. I want you to really see that beauty. I want you to see the color of your eyes, you know, the way that your hair looks. I want you to see something beautiful within yourself. This is a time to celebrate that because when you see beauty within yourself, life starts to change. You start to actually experience life in a more beautiful way because you see the inner beauty, you will also see the outer beauty more as well. And so this is a time to explore beauty in multitude of ways. You can also 
um, express beauty artistically with song, dance, art, um, even beautiful acts and deeds to others. It's There's so many different ways of being beautiful. And men can be beautiful too. Beauty is a quality of certain types of values that represent goodness and life itself. And I really like this. Matthew Dickinson and Jonathan Evans, they wrote a book in Ents, Elves, and Eridor, The Environmental Vision of J.R.R. Tolkien. I have this book and it's a great book. They said, Five principles express the beauty of Middle Earth and environmental ethic of Tolkien. Number one, the universe is the work of a divine creation. Number two, the created world is good and it has the inherent worth and beauty enough to fight for and protect. Number three, creation has a purpose to bring pleasure to the creator, and all those who dwell within the creation itself. Number four, the created order and its inhabitants are vulnerable to evil embodied in a cosmic enemy. And number five, the mission of the people dwelling in the world is to acknowledge the goodness and beauty of the earth, fulfill its purpose, and assist in its restoration from evil or the corruption from a fallen consciousness and just forgetting about the connection to nature. So beauty is a time of celebration of beauty around you, of yourself, of everything. And that's what Vana represents. So more so than just physical beauty, it is about you really recognizing another type of beauty, an aspect of beauty that is felt within you. And it's not so much always seen, but it's something that you can feel. And if you read poetry or listen to music that moves you and you can find beauty in many things. Beauty is something that I believe that Vana represents very much so, not only in the flowers and the environment, but also in the creatures that she also helps to take care of, beauty that you find in animals and all beings on earth, and you find them beautiful, and that makes you want to protect them. It makes you want to protect this innocent type of life, and so there's a lot of connection with environmentalism and protection of the earth, and that's those were very big values for Tolkien himself. So he wrote that with his Valar. The other thing that she represents as far as a power is the sun as a life energy to keep going on in your life. There is this quote, beauty will save the world by Fedor Dostoevsky. And it is about when something is beautiful to you, you will find ways to protect it, to keep it going. Some people that have had some experiences that have caused them to lose hope in life, um, me personally, what brings you often back is the idea that beauty exists in the world still. And when you find beauty in many ways, whether it be the beauty of a friendship whether it be the beauty of what you visually see. Um, it could be many different ways that you can experience beauty, but beauty often saves lives when they awaken to beauty once again. So uh, that quote comes from Fedor's, uh, his novel that I do wanna read. And it's a famous novel called The Idiot, which is actually a mockery because he's not an idiot, but he is a, he's a character, a prince character that believes in the saving power of beauty. And so for those that don't understand this, and this was a very personal novel of Fedor, he wanted to express, I guess, his inner feelings about beauty. And so this is what it says, the saving power of beauty in the prince's life could not overcome his own sickness, but nonetheless illumined his vision. What mattered though, 
it, what matter though it be only disease, an abnormal tension of the brain, if when I recall and analyze the moment, it seems to have been one of harmony and beauty in the highest degree, an instant of deepest sensation, overflowing with unbounded joy and rapture, ecstatic devotion and completion of life. In the midst of his suffering, he glimpsed, though in a paradoxical manner, the heart of reality through awakening to beauty itself. Vana loved the, the laureline tree so much for its beauty and did everything she could to bring it back. At first she was doing the singing and she was you know, pouring the, the, the light with laure, um, laurelin on it. But if you think about something beautiful in your life, in the world to preserve and to protect, even if it is within your own life to preserve your own life, to protect your own life, this especially helps you find that second wind again in terms of coming back around and, and being renewed in life, very much like the sun energy. This especially helps those who see no point in life. Beauty itself is the enjoyment of looking at it or experience with it can be enough. And as one famous uh, quote in a movie was about, that was about a woman who she was suicidal and she was ready to lose it all. And she decided that there was far too much beauty to, to leave it all behind, that there's far too much beauty in the world. And that is the same story for me too. There's far too much beauty to leave. So tools to help you harness these energies of beauty and of the ever youthfulness. These are some of the crystals and some of the tools that can help you. Pink tourmaline, I decided, was a pink, a pink crystal of divine love. So very much uh, close to um, pink uh, quartz or qu rose quartz. And it represents the crown chakra of divine love and compassion. Yet with pink tourmaline, there are other types of metals that are involved with it. So iron, magnesium, which can give its colorful appearance. It has a little bit of green and purple and blue, sometimes yellow and red mixed in with the pink. So it's like a field of flowers. It's not just one color, it's many, it's a variety. And that's also something really beautiful about beauty is the variety in this world. And when you can recognize that, I think that, that also adds to more beauty because you get more of a variety of beauty and not just one type. So the pink tourmaline is a crystal that I thought represented her very well. And citrine, which is a light golden yellow color, and it's associated with sun energy. It's known to radiate positivity and joy. It represents the solar plexus area. So it's all about self-esteem and self-confidence. So if you're having a trouble, uh, trouble finding your inner beauty or trouble to experience those types of feelings of confidence, then this is a type of crystal that can definitely help you. It can allow you to see your true beauty and it can allow you to get more confidence within yourself. And I also had um, yellow star shaped flowers. So there's a particular type of flower called the um, Eleanor and that shows up in Tolkien's writings as one of the flowers of La Florian. So this is associated with her as well because El is star and Anor is sun. And it is sun star. Eleanor means sun star in um, Sindarin. So it's a small star shaped yellow flower of La Florian brought originally to Middle Earth by the elves. Now that is the name of it in Middle Earth. But Tolkien's letters said that it was a, a bigger version of Pimpernel, which is na native to Europe, North Africa, and Western Asia. And other flowers that look like Pimpernel is daffodils, which have a star shape to them, sunflowers, sun-shaped, goldenrod, which reminds me of Vanna's golden hair because of the way that it's shaped, yellow roses and tulips because she was really into roses, and 
these types of flowers you can actually use at your altar if you want to create a fairy altar if you want to just surround yourself during this time with flowers like a bouquet of yellow flowers it just might represent vana's energy around this time and this is also how you can celebrate nosna lothion so the other thing that you can use as a tool to harness the energy are sun symbols to revere the beauty and life-giving light of the sun since she represents that and arian um, was one of her maidens that pulled the actual ship of the sun so this is a beautiful way of um i think celebrating the birth of flowers if you want to just focus specifically on those types of flowers and Pimpernel is a nice little tiny star-shaped yellow flower. I, I've seen them actually around my neighborhood, but they are native mainly to uh, Europe, Africa, and Asia. But you should be able to find them easily here. Now, the other way that you can celebrate, because she is also um, associated with this particular type of holiday. There are several ways that you could celebrate Nos No Lothion. Now, Tolkien was not descriptive about it, but he said that they were getting ready for it in Gondolin, like the elven realm of old, that they would celebrate the birth of flowers. And so there's several ways that you can celebrate it too. You can go out and enjoy a day in the sun that day, you can also um, work in your garden and you can start to plant maybe some of your flowers that you may not have already planted. Maybe they're a little bit more of a later bloomer. You can reflect on the beauty of flowers in nature by taking a nice nature walk. You can have uh, floral tea and also pastries made with different types of edible flowers. You could look up recipes for it to create it. I myself love jasmine tea, and I also love lavender cakes. You can also light a yellow candle at this time, so you can remind yourself of the energy of the sun and vana, and you can surround the altar with flower petals. And you can also use those flower petals by taking a bath, a luxurious bath with flower petals. You can wear flower crowns and have a party with friends and family. You can celebrate that way or just wear a flower crown on that day. You can adorn your skin with floral lotions and scents. You can, you know, just treat yourself and give yourself that special day of celebration of birth of flowers. There's many ways that you can celebrate. I'm sure you can think of other ways, but those are the ways that I would do it and enjoy that day. So Vana, is finished, but if you are part of Tia Elda Lieva, you can join us in our private ritual and we will celebrate Nos Lo Na Lo Theon together. And we will do um, more of uh, a ritual in terms of harnessing the energies that Vana represents. So if you are interested, please join my channel so you can join in and you can take part in this actual original Tolkien holiday that he wrote within his world of the elves. And so I hope you all have a wonderful day and thank you so much for joining me and I will see you all in the next video. Namarie.